This evening we're uh, looking at the doctrine of the Trinity, and what I'd like to do is just introduce it from Matthew 28 in that baptismal formula that Jesus gives to his disciples as he sends them out to make disciples of all the nations. I think um, perhaps this may be the, the clearest part where it's at least all gathered together, but we're going to find that there are many other places the Bible teaches the doctrine of the Trinity. So let's begin by reading this portion of Scripture. Let's look at verses 16 through 20 in Matthew chapter 28. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening. Now again, last time we started this whole subject by dealing with perhaps the most foundational doctrine of all, and that is the fact that God exists. And we sought to prove that he exists in a way, well actually we saw there are many different ways we could do it, but we sought to do it in a way perhaps that um, I think the Lord gives to us most clearly in nature, and that is through the doctrine or the, the, the principle of cause and effect. Uh, for every effect, there has to be a cause that is great enough. And whatever we see in the effect must also be in the cause. And as we just look around at the life that is around us, at the information, at the, the idea that, that we ourselves are uh, conscious of our own existence and that we are personal and that we have uh, volition or will, we have purpose in life, we are moral and so forth, we realize these things didn't just spring out of the ground, which doesn't have all these things, but that whatever caused us must have these things. We look particularly at how the DNA is so full of information, information that uh, evolution, which really can't be observed because it doesn't actually take place, rather devolution is taking place. There is no information being added to the DNA that we've seen, but there is certainly information being loss from the DNA, which, uh, well, which is consistent with the second law of thermodynamics, that everything is tending toward increasing randomness. It's not organizing itself and going upward, but rather it's deorganizing itself and going downward. And that's expect exactly what we'd expect because sin is in the picture. You know, since that sermon last week, there are also a couple of other things that uh, I, I thought were somewhat, well, Quite, quite amazing. One of them was a conversation with Greg, just pointing out that whenever a cell divides, and certainly as, um, you know, as the, the ovum is fertilized and we're a single cell as we begin, and then we begin to uh, divide and, and our bodies begin to build, that that information that's on the DNA has to be able to replicate itself perfectly for the eventual trillions of cells that we're going to have in our body. And there is the mechanism to do that, the DNA replicates perfectly. All that information, all those volumes of information. Then another thing came across my path, which is um, uh, an article that I read that pointed out that the DNA actually contains much more information than we originally thought. And it's interesting that a vast majority of the information on the DNA is really a set of instructions on how to use the information that is on the DNA molecule. So again, that which caused us not only put the information on building certain things and the formula for doing that, but also the instructions exactly how to do that, how to put that information that is there to use. Again, can evolution explain how that all came about? Not at all. But certainly an infinite, eternal, and unchangeable God who is infinite in wisdom and power certainly does explain that. Now, as we move on from there to uh, begin to understand what this God is like, we're going to look, first of all, at the doctrine of the Trinity. We've seen that God exists. Well, what is this God actually 
like? Well, he's, he is several things, as you know from your study of Scripture. But tonight we do want to consider the fact that he is triune. That there is one God, but there are three persons in the Godhead. Now we want to look at a couple of different things about this. We want to see, first of all, why it's important that we believe that God is triune. We might say that that's the applicational point. We want to see that first before we delve into what the Bible actually teaches on the subject. And hopefully understanding its importance will help us pay more attention as we look at Scripture as to why we believe this to be the case. So first of all, why is it important that we believe that God is triune? Well, certainly, first of all, because this is what God has revealed about himself in the Scripture. Now, we... We talked about the different things we're going to be looking at, and I also made mention of it in my prayer. There are certain things in Scripture that, you know, Christians differ on and can still be Christians uh, because they're not essential to the doctrine of salvation. But this is one of those things that is essential to that doctrine. You must believe the Trinity in order to be saved because this is the true God. Those who deny the Trinity are those who are outside the body of Christ, those who do not have salvation. And there are certainly, I mean, just as I mentioned before, for, just, for every doctrine of Scripture, there is someone who denies the truth. In this case, there are several. The Jehovah's Witnesses, of course, deny the Trinity. They do believe there is one God. They believe that is the Father but they believe that Jesus is a created being, that he is a God, but not the God. They also believe the Spirit is nothing but an impersonal force that God sends out to do his will. Now, Mormons believe that all three persons, uh, the, you know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all three God, but each of them are separate gods. We call them polytheists, the uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses are Unitarians, and Unitarians deny the Trinity. And Mormons are polytheists. Uh, they deny the Trinity. They deny the fact that there's one God. And then we have the Apostolic Church and the United Pentecostal Church, which, again, we ought not to really call churches because they are not true churches, who do believe in one God, but they believe that all three persons the Bible speaks about are really the same person. So what we have here are different, um, what we would call heresies, uh, regarding uh, the nature of God. We do want to keep in balance the fact that there is one God and the fact that there are three persons. Now, I mentioned that this teaching is essential to salvation. Thankfully, there aren't that many doctrines or that many teachings of Scripture that are essential so that salvation might be simple. I mean, if you had to believe absolutely everything in the Bible, understand it perfectly, and, and uh, you know, embrace that in order to be saved, there would be very few people, if any, that could be saved. But the Lord has made it relatively simple. What are the things we have to believe? We certainly have to believe in the true Jesus. We have to believe in the Jesus who is God and man. If we don't believe in that Jesus, we're believing a false Jesus, and that Jesus can't save us. We need to believe along those lines that Jesus was born of a virgin, that his father is, is God, that he was supernaturally conceived, his human nature, in the womb of the virgin. Otherwise, he is an ordinary man, a sinner, and he cannot save us. We do have to believe in salvation by grace through faith alone, that it has nothing to do with our works, but it is purely a gift of God's grace. Paul tells us if we're trusting in our works, then we are under the curse of the law of that broken covenant of works, and we are condemned. It must be by faith alone that it may be by grace alone. Otherwise, we're not saved. We have to believe that, that the book God gave us to express these things to us is God's word, and it's an errant. Otherwise, we really can't receive anything it has to say because we really wouldn't know whether it was true or not. We might be embracing or believing something that is part of the Bible that isn't true. We have to believe it's all true because that is, in fact, what God says about his word. And we must also believe the Trinity, 
that God is as he reveals himself in scripture. There is one God, there are three persons. This sets the God of the Bible apart from virtually all other gods, I should say from all other gods, besides the fact that he's the only one who really exists. But I'm talking about the conceptions that people have of their particular gods. If we don't believe the Trinity, if we don't believe that God is triune, tripersonal, then we're believing in a false God, and a false God cannot save us. Now again, we do have to realize that there is, of course, mercy with regard to God. I'm not saying that you can't be a believer and, and um, not, you know, well, that if you don't fully understand these things, you can't be a believer. Because you can be saved and not fully. I mean, who really fully understands the doctrine of the Trinity? But I do believe it's also true that if you are saved, if you have the Spirit of God uh, residing in your soul, if you have that anointing that teaches you all things, that the Spirit of God will lead you to that truth. He bears witness to the truth. And when that doctrine is explained to you clearly from Scripture, even though you may not have accepted or even understood it or even known that, God was triune, you know, before coming to Christ, I believe the Spirit of God will lead you to that truth because he has come to bear witness to the truth. He will not bear witness to a lie. He will not allow you to continue to believe things that are not true, especially when it comes to your salvation. If you are a child of God, he will make sure that you understand that which is most important to you. And certainly the Trinity is one of those things. He'll also help you to understand the other things that we've just seen. He won't allow you to continue to believe things that will ultimately destroy you. So again, why is it important that we believe this? Well, this is one of those foundational teachings. This sets the true God apart from false gods. If we are to worship the true God, if we are to be saved, we have to believe in what God reveals concerning himself. And again... We may not fully understand this doctrine, but at least we can understand enough of it, what, you know, what the Lord reveals uh, about it in Scripture. And again, we can just summarize it in this way, one God, but three persons. Now let's uh, try to understand from Scripture why it is we believe this. Why believe we believe there is just one God, but that this one God has these three persons, or basically these three centers of consciousness with, within, we'll call the being of God for these purposes, it. Uh, God is the infinite, eternal, and unchangeable spirit that has all of the attributes that we you know, attribute to God, that he attributes to himself in the word of God. Those all can be attributed to that infinite, eternal, and unchangeable spirit, that infinite spirit that we call God. But within this infinite spirit that we call God, there are three distinct personalities, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the question is, why do we believe this? Again, well, it's because this is what God has uh, revealed to us from Scripture. First of all, why do we believe there's only one God? As opposed to Mormons who believe in many gods, uh, po possibly even an infinite number of gods. Well, certainly we can most easily show this from Scripture, but we can also prove it from natural revelation. I'm going to just take a crack at it. If you don't get this, don't worry. We're going to go on to Scripture after this. But I think it's, it's another plank, as it were, in natural theology or in apologetics, uh, proving not only that God exists, but the God who exists is one God. Now, here's just one way of arguing that particular point. And actually, I was having a conversation earlier today with uh, Jonathan Billy on this. And uh, perhaps Einstein would take, uh, uh, he might disagree with this, but I do think this has to be the case. First of all, we ask the question, is it possible that space could end somewhere? Is it possible that space does not extend infinitely in all different directions? Is it possible that it's bounded by nothing somewhere? And again, nothing is not empty space. Nothing is, as Jonathan Edwards said, what sleeping rocks dream of. That's nothing. Well, nothing is an impossibility. Space must extend in every direction infinitely, 
It cannot have boundaries, which means it is infinite. Now, if space is infinite, then that means that whatever caused it must be infinite, right? Because for every effect, and we would say space perhaps is an effect, unless space is God itself, and I'm saying that God is empty space, but perhaps, uh, you know, being a spirit and so forth, um, his being, this is his being, space is his being. But let's say that it is a created thing. Whatever caused it must be infinite because the cause has to be at least as great as the effect. It has to be greater than the effect, right? So if space is infinite, then that which caused it is also infinite. But the point is, there can only be one infinite being if that is the case because you can't have two infinites. Now here's the part where it gets a little bit tricky. Because if you had two infinites, they would limit each other. And then both of them would be finite. Does that make sense? And two finites, no matter how large they are, could never be infinite. Because infinite is infinitely greater than finite. So the point is, whatever caused this infinite space must itself be infinite, which means it must be one. So the being that created space must be infinite and he must be one. Now I said that's an argument from uh, natural revelation and it is a valid argument actually. But if that's beyond you right now, we can come back to that later when we study apologetics uh, in a little while in our Wednesday study. But we have something that is even more certain than what we can reason out in natural revelation. We have the word of God. Now, this is one of the things that is, the most, it is easily proved from Scripture. This morning, for instance, we saw Moses write in Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Well, it could be simpler than that. There is only one Lord, there is only one God. If you want to debate a Jehovah's Witness, well, actually, you don't have to debate Jehovah's Witness on this, but Mormons, really. You can go to the Scriptures in Isaiah. Some of the clearest passages that we have. Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. By the way, Jesus calls himself by that title. I am the first and I am the last, and there is no God besides me. Could God have been any clearer than that? Verse 8. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it, and you are my witnesses? Is there any God besides me, or is there any other rock? I know of none. The God who has infinite knowledge is not aware of any other gods. He is the only God. Isaiah 45, verse 5, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me. And then lastly, Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 10. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Uh, could we be wrong in... in you know, uh, believing that the Bible teaches there is only one God. Now here is where we lose the Mormons who not only believe that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are three separate gods, although it's interesting that they do see them as separate persons. That's something that others deny. They believe they're separate persons, but they believe they're separate gods. They believe in essence that the Father was once a man who became a God, that Jesus was born a man and he became a God, and the Holy Spirit wasn't born as a man but remained a spirit and I think is God. But this is just three among an infinite number of gods with an infinite succession going backwards of, of a God who created men who became gods and then created another planet of men who became gods and so forth, all the way back to infinity. In essence, they don't believe there's really any beginning, but there's this infinite succession of these finite gods. I mean, you can't have two infinites, right, because they limit each other. Well, they have an infinite number of finite gods. 
They are polytheists. The Bible says there is only one God. Now that we lose the Mormons, as I've said at this point, but the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Apostolic Church, the United Pentecostal Church, and all Trinitarian uh, churches, and again, I'd be careful how I group those together, all agree that there is only one God. Where we depart with them is with the three persons. The Jehovah's Witnesses deny that Jesus is the God. The, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that he is a God. They believe that he is a created God being, they believe that he is the greatest of all God's creations, an angel that was made into a man. And they believe that the Holy Spirit isn't even a person, but an impersonal force, God's power sent out to do his will. Now the Apostolic Church and the United Pentecostal Church believe that there is only one person in the Godhead, as the Jehovah's Witnesses believe, but oddly enough, they don't think it's the Father so to speak, who is the person, but rather it is Jesus, the one that the Jehovah's Witnesses deny. He is the one person in the Godhead, and he is the Father, and he is the Son, and he is the Holy Spirit. The Father is his divine nature. The Son is his human nature. The Spirit is another name for his divine nature. So basically, they believe in one God, but they deny the Trinity. Now again, I thought it was interesting to note that the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Apostolic and the UPC Church agree that God is one person, but they disagree on who that person or whom that person is. So in order to deal with these particular heresies, we need to look at a couple of different things. And in doing so, we will prove the doctrine of the Trinity as well. To refute the Jehovah's Witnesses, we need to prove that Jesus is God, that the Son is, in fact, God, and that the Spirit is a person, and that he is God. And to refute the apostolic in the United Pentecostal Church, we need to show that the persons are distinct persons. They are not the same person. I hope everybody's with me so far. So first of all, some evidence that Jesus is God. I think the simplest way to prove this is in John chapter 1, verse 1. Not surprisingly, because I think it's one of the plainest passages of Scripture. And also verse 14. This is what verse 1 says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, who is this Word that was in the beginning with God and that who is in fact God? Well, verse 14 tells us it is the one who became flesh and tabernacled among us that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now if you've ever talked to a Jehovah's Witness, you'll know that they go to this passage as well and they believe this passage proves that Jesus isn't God. And the reason why is because in their translation, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Not the God, but a God. Now, why does their translation contain that translation? It's because they don't understand Greek. It's because the person who translated the, the New World Scripture, or the New World Translation, not only did not know Greek, but had a vested interest in disproving that the fact that Jesus is God. Because if they understood the Greek, they would know that the lack of the article there, and by the way, in, in the Greek, there are definite articles, and there are even indefinite articles. And when you don't have the article, it's taken indefinitely, which is where you get the word a, okay? When you have the article, and then you have a word that doesn't have the article, and there's a form of to be, you know, I am, be, and was, and so forth, the word was God, that the article is there to show which is the subject and which is the predicate. Now, if you understand grammar, perhaps that, that makes sense to you. How do you know who it is that's being spoken of? Is it God or is it the Word? Well, Word has the definite article, the Word. That's the subject. And God is the predicate. It doesn't have the article. That's how you can distinguish the two. Now, in, in the, the, the Greek, it, literally, if we were to translate it, it would be like this. God was the Word. 
the word order in Greek is shifted around to show emphasis. And if we were to translate this, then according to at least the author who is John, or and behind John, of course, the Holy Spirit, what it's doing is emphasizing the fact that the word was God. That, that's the important point he wants us to see. This one who tabernacled among us, this one who revealed the Father is, in fact, God himself, although we are going to see later, it's not the Father, but it is Jesus Christ. Now, if the Jehovah's Witnesses were consistent in their translation, then as you work your way through John, you come to other places where the word God does not have the definite article, and they would have to translate it with the indefinite article, A, all the way through. Verse 6, for instance, they would have to say, there came a man sent from a God whose name was John. Now, they won't translate it that way because they know that it's the true God that sent John. John tells us the word, that is, Jesus was with God in the beginning, and that word was God. And it really can't get any clearer than that. But we do have many other references again in Scripture. Paul says that before he took upon himself the likeness of men, that he existed in the form of God. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, equality notice, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Now, how many beings are there that exist in the form of God? Well, there's only one, and that's God himself. He was in the form of God, he's equal with God, and we don't have time to look at it, but when he emptied himself, he did not divest himself of divinity. But he took to himself the likeness of sinful flesh, the likeness of men. That is his emptying, not his divinity. When the wise men came after his birth, they worshipped him. Well, the only one who is worthy of worship is God. When the disciples saw Jesus command the wind and the waves, they said, what manner of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him, and they worshipped him. Thomas, when he appears to him after his resurrection, says to him, my Lord and my God. Now, all of those things would be blasphemous if it was not true of Jesus Christ, that he is, in fact, God. And Jesus, of course, who was very uh, careful to make sure that his disciples always believed the truth and did things that were right, he would have rebuked them for worshiping him. They he would have rebuked Thomas for saying that he was God, but he didn't because, as a matter of fact, Jesus is God in human flesh. John also mentions that Jesus created all things in verse 3. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Moses writes in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus is the one who created all things. God is the one who created all things. Jesus is God. Now, again, there are many, many other proofs of the fact that Jesus is God, but we'll have to stop there and move to the next point. The Spirit is a person, and the Spirit is also God. That's important to the doctrine of the Trinity. There is one God, but there are three persons who are called God in Scripture. Three centers of personality, three consciousnesses, as it were, within this one being. Now, are the Jehovah's Witnesses right when they say that the, the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force? Well, not according to Luke, who writes in Acts 13, 2, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Notice he uses two personal pronouns, I and me, and that he speaks and he commands and he has a will. That's not true of something that isn't personal. He is a person and he is God. Now Luke writes that the early church, in order to support those who were converted on the day of Pentecost, that they began to sell their, their possessions and lay them at the feet of the apostles. And we know that there was an Ananias and Sapphira who conspired together to sell their property but hold back part of the, 
of the purchase of the, of the proceeds and to tell them that what they were giving was everything that, that the property sold for. So they, they lied. But Peter said in Acts 5, verses 3 through 4, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? By the way, how can you lie to an impersonal force? And to keep back some of the price of the land while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Okay, you've lied to the Holy Spirit, and in doing so, you have lied to God. The Spirit of God was also active in creation. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Uh, in Psalm 104, verse 30, the psalmist writes, You send forth your spirit, and they are created. The Spirit of God has infinite knowledge. 1 Corinthians 2.11, For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now, how can any being know the thoughts of an infinite being except that being also be infinite? So the point is Jesus is God and the spirit is God. And that shows or explains why the names of the Son and the Spirit are paralleled with the Father in the baptismal formula that we read about in Matthew chapter 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You can't parallel a divine being with created beings in this kind of expression. It would be blasphemy. Baptize them in the name of the infinite, eternal, and unchangeable God, and then this creature wouldn't make any sense. But it makes sense when you understand that all three of these persons are divine. Jesus is God. That's why when you worship Jesus Christ, who is God in human flesh, you are not committing idolatry. You are not blaspheming God, but you're honoring him because this one that you worship is God. If he wasn't, you would be guilty of idolatry. The Spirit is God. And that's why Peter says in 2 Peter 1.4 that you are partakers of the divine nature and why Paul says that you are a temple of God. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? The reason why you partake of the divine nature, the reason why you're called the temple of God is because God himself actually dwells in your soul. You are literally a temple of God because of the Spirit. Now, we lost the Mormons at the one God point, and now we've just lost the Jehovah's Witnesses who would strongly disagree with us on this doctrine. They believe Jesus is a creature. They believe the Spirit is an impersonal force, and as long as they believe that, they believe in a false God, and they are condemned. Not to mention the fact that they believe in an entirely false way of salvation, even if they did have the true God, but they don't have either. And they are excluded from the kingdom of God on that point, unless they repent and believe the truth. But we do have one other group that we need to deal with, and that is the Apostolic Church and the United Pentecostal Church, which together believe that there is only one person in the Godhead. Now, they believe the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are God. And they believe that there's only one God, and they are the one God. But they believe that they are the same person. And that, too, is an error. They will go to the wall on this. They'll say, for instance, in, in our particular text that we're looking at this evening, notice that Jesus says, go and baptize them in the name, not in the names, but in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, believing that to be evidence that Jesus is really referring to one person. Now, how do we answer that? Well, first of all, we would say that uh, in, in Greek, very often, uh, in order to conserve words, there is a um, particular way that you can use language and, and a particular, I can't think of the exact term I'm looking for. It's not a figure of speech. It's perhaps, mm, I can't think of what it is. But anyway, it's called an elision. 
where you have words drop out of a sentence in order not to be repetitious. In other words, if this did not have the elision, what we would have is this. Baptize him in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, which is, in fact, what Jesus means here. Either that, or he perhaps is thinking there is one name that, that applies to all three, and that would be Yahweh, the name of the Lord, because that is a name that applies to all three. But I believe that what's going on here is elision which means you understand the repetition of in the name of, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Now, is that all we have to go on? Or is there any other indication in Scripture that God is, in fact, multi-personal and he is not simply uh, you know, unipersonal? There's not just one person, but there's a plurality of persons? Well, I think what we've seen so far could point that out, but let's look at the Old Testament again. In the Old Testament, we do see many many uh, places where God reveals himself in, in a plurality of persons. Let me give you a couple of examples. When God created man, in Genesis 1, verse 26, just before he did it, he said this, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, why did God use a the plural there? Well, again, the Apostolic Church, the United Pentecostal Church says that God was speaking to the angels, that the angels are also in the image of God. And I think we would have to agree with them at that point. The angels are in the image of God. But we would have to disagree with them on the fact that angels cannot Create. They do not have creative ability. God said, let us make. So whoever God was speaking to has creative power. Now, who has creative power in the scriptures besides the Father? We've already seen the Son. All things came into being by him, and without him nothing has come into being that has come into being. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God sent forth his Spirit, and they are created well, the Son and the Spirit have creative power. Let us make man in our image. Jesus is the image of God, and he has creative power. This is a Trinitarian act. Again, there's a repetition of this, this well, of the Lord using the plural pronoun us to refer to himself. Man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Uh, Isaiah 6, 8, who will go for us and whom shall we send? Again, this idea of God referring to himself in the plurality. In Genesis 19, after the angels brought Lot and his daughters out of the city, we read in verse 24, now listen to this carefully. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. I don't know if you've ever noticed that or not, but uh, we have here the Lord on earth, who was the one who stayed behind with, uh, with Abraham while the other two angels went into Sodom and Gomorrah in order to get Lot and his family out of there. That Lord who is on earth, the angel of the Lord, uh, rains down fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah, but he does it from the Lord out of heaven. So here is the Lord on earth, here is the Lord in heaven. Both of them are called the Lord. And that is interesting. Another example is Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7, where David writes this. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of a brightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. Now, the author to the Hebrews quotes this passage, and he says that this is the Father speaking to the Son. Of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Before Jesus Christ comes into the world, the Father is speaking to the Son, and the Father is calling the Son God. I think that shows a distinction of persons, as well as showing that both of these persons are God. Now, again, there are many other examples in the Old Testament of plurality in God not the least of which God chooses to call himself by the plural form of the word God. I mean, the Hebrew word for God is El, but he uses 
most often, sometimes he uses that singular form, but most often he uses the word Elohim, which means plurality. So he uses a plural noun to refer to himself. So again, we have evidence in the Old Testament that God is a plurality, the use of the word us, the fact that we have conversations between two divine beings, the fact that one divine being on earth is calling down fire and brimstone from the other in heaven, and yet it's also equally clear there is only one God. Now finally, we have the many references to the interaction between these persons to show that they are separate persons. And again, why would I... Why would we even have to look at this? I mean, why would we even have to go through this, this, uh, this study? Why would we have to have this impressed upon us? It's because in the light of this, of this clear evidence, there are people who deny this and would actually die for that. And what I'm saying is the church has believed historically that God is defined by this. This distinguishes the true God from false gods. We must believe this about God. God, or we will believe in a false God and be found to be idolaters after all. Well, finally, as I've said, we have many references to the interaction between these persons. We've already seen the Father speaking to the Son before the incarnation. And I don't know if you noticed, but in John 1.1, 1, 1, we read about the Word who is God, who was with God. Now, how can you be with yourself? in that regard. You have the Word and you have God. He was with God in the beginning and the Word was also God. So again, you have the idea of plurality there. The author to the Hebrews tells us that God made the world through His Son. Again, we've already seen that in John 1, 3 and we look back at Genesis 1, 1, but this is what he says. God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Now again, the Apostolic Church and the United Pentecostal Church believe that the Son of God is the human nature of Jesus. But the Son was the one through whom God made the world. And the world was made long before Jesus became a man, long before the Son ever began to exist. So the author to the Hebrews here says the Son existed before the incarnation. He didn't become a Son at the incarnation. He was already a Son. He already existed. He made the worlds. So the Father makes the world through the Son. And the Son there cannot refer to his human nature because the world was made long before his human nature came into being. Again, we read that the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. The Father loves the Son and shows him all the things that he is doing. They're distinct. And then Jesus told his disciples regarding the Holy Spirit in John 16, verse 7, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, who is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now again, the, the Apostolic Church and the United Pentecostal Church believes that the Spirit of God is basically the divine nature of Christ. But they also believe that Jesus, as, as the Son of God, has the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in him which means that all that is God is dwelling in the human nature of Christ. So why is, why is Jesus on earth telling his disciples that he has to go to heaven before he can send the Holy Spirit since the Spirit of God is right there with him? I mean, he is, in fact, that is his divine nature. Why would that have to be? Jesus says, I will send him to you. I and him denote two different persons, and that makes, of course, perfect sense if they are distinct persons. All three of them were present at the baptism. Jesus was baptized. The heavens were opened. The Spirit of God descending as a dove and the voice of the Father saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus says, Baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
The true God is three persons, but he is only one God. This is how the Lord has revealed himself. And we know that the Lord does not lie. This is not something that we have the right to reject. And we may not fully understand it, but we do need to accept it. Some people have, have criticized the doctrine of the Trinity saying it's a contradiction. How can God be one and yet three? Well, I want you to understand this is no contradiction because God does not say I am one God and I am three gods. That would be a contradiction. I am one person and I am three persons. That would be a contradiction. But he says I am one God and I am three persons. That's not a contradiction. We may not fully understand it. But it is not a contradiction, and it is clearly what God says about himself. This sets God, the only God, the true God, apart from any other God. Again, besides the fact he's the only one that exists, and belief in any other God has to amount to idolatry. So what is the point of this? The point is... This is essential to our salvation. We have to believe it because this is true about God. This is how he distinguishes himself in Scripture. We don't have fully to understand it. We simply accept it by faith. So may the Lord help us to see. By the way, if this was too much information too quickly, the notes are going to be posted, the video is going to be posted, the audio is going to be posted. You can review it in many different ways, and certainly there's plenty of good books written on the subject. But the point is... We do need to see it because this is what God has revealed. We do need to accept it. If we have the Spirit of God in us, he will bear witness to this as the truth. And he will convince us that it is true in order that we might believe the true God, that we might be trusting in the true God who made us and redeemed us through his Son. Well, may the Lord grant that we would not only see it for ourselves, to be safe ourselves, but to know it well enough to be able to express it to others that may be confused on the subject or may even be antagonistic. One of our jobs as Christians, one of our duties is to try to understand the Word of God as best we can so that we can share it with other people so that they can come to know the true God as well, right? I mean, if we are to love others as much as we love ourselves, certainly we want them to be saved. If they need to know this in order to be saved, then... We should try to learn it so that we can communicate it. You know, and if, if certainly if we love God, if we're to love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, we're going to receive what he says about himself. If we believe otherwise, then we're not truly loving him. We need to receive what God has told us regarding himself. Well, may the Lord grant us the grace to do that. Let's uh, bow in a moment of prayer and ask the Lord to apply this to us. We need to apply it.